And welcome back, everybody who was there before, who was here uh, uh, half an hour ago, and who is just joining now. We are back with Sean Fermar. He's about to. You can you can wave. You can wave. You can say hi. Uh, <laughs> yeah, and he's about to give you the speech. But first, who is Sean? And Sean has a, a very interesting fact about him. Sean holds the world record for answering the most end service bus questions. That means today, with you, with your help, we can actually beat the world record and give him even more questions. <laughs> Very much looking forward to that. With over 20 years of experience, he specializes in providing simple solutions for complex uh, business requirements using end service bus and applying SOA principles. As a solution architect with particular software, the creators of end service bus, Sean provides support, training, and consulting for customers using end service bus and the particular platform. I'm wondering how many times I said end service bus. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, guys, uh, you are the audience. You are the main thing ab uh, about this online event. So keep the chat alive. Uh, give us all the questions. We will not wait for the end of the speech to answer your questions. We will stop in the middle and answer them in the middle of the session. So come on, be active, talk to us, and uh, we will talk back to you. And now, Sean, the stage is yours. Welcome. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to talk about um, how we uh, deal with uh, with a big monoliths or how we decompose them, or at least a new uh, perspective or a different perspective of uh, dealing with uh, decomposing the monolith. Um, we we all have been there, I hope, uh, once at least. Uh, I've definitely been there a couple of times when we start a new project. We we gather some business requirements, we build a team, and then we start analyzing the domain. We build, we talk to the stakeholders. They tell us all about the departments and what the system is supposed to do. And um, they introduce all the different parts of the domain, all the lingua, uh, uh, language around the domain, what is, what does an invoice mean and what does an order mean and what does a quote mean and what does a claim mean and so on and so forth and we start building this um, this model we that that uh, starts off with uh, the database um, and that database is uh, might look this is of course a very um, you know very uh, light and uh, only a small part of the system, but what we can definitely see is that we have like entities with a lot of fields and we have relationships between between those entities and we have constraints between those entities. So, you know, if we want to add a user, uh, he must have an, or, or, sorry, if we, if we want to add an account, we must have a user. If we want to make an order, we must have the user. Uh, and those constraints uh, are uh, what determines what has to be done at, at what sequence and what are the dependencies and the constraints around those dependencies. Uh, for example, if we add a user, uh, then we have to have some other fields in some other uh, table, usually the ID and the rest. And then we look at, uh, at the, the same operation, we're trying to delete something, then yes, those, those constraints appear. And of course, that introduces some amount of coupling uh, that we'll talk about later. Um, so we build this database, we did this, the, the, the diagram first, and then we build the database and we start looking at the uh, business layer. And the business player is trying to take those objects and and model them as a more uh, be, rather than just being crude operations, crud operations. They're being like more of a a uh, some bis. They represent the business logic of those objects or those entities, um, and we add all these very uh, sophisticated layers, uh, some, some to do with security, anti-corruption layers, uh, verification, all kind of lookup tables. We build a, a lovely uh, kind of well-designed uh, code base and we start adding the UI. Now we need to actually make this thing work, right? So um, we build the UI, we, we 
create you know a login form and the uh, the uh, uh, products form and the the, the shipping and, and order uh, flow and all that. And um, I don't know if you, um, if that resonates with you, but I, I usually feel that at this stage, the crunches begin to show up. Yeah, we're, we're you know, what, what looks really well on the, on the database and the um, business logic layer doesn't look so well on the, on, on the, on the UI. And, um, and naturally, the UI is a kind of a composition layer. Yeah? It's like it, it does a lot of things. It doesn't show only one model at, at any given stage. So that, that that's okay. We we get through that. We we um, um, we manage to put together um, a pretty decent uh, system or an application, and um, and now we're either in production or we uh, or in uh, accept and testing and the users or the business comes back with some requests oh we need to do you know when we we looked at the screens in the you know in the present your presentations they look different now it's live no that's not exactly what 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 we wanted how about we change this to behave a little bit different maybe we don't show the other things maybe uh, when when a user clicks this thing or this that that should behave differently, and we start kind of the process of of ev um, evolution of our uh, well designed system. Yeah, and usually uh, that might take a year, maybe two years, but we start basically hacking the system. We the, the users come back and say, hey, can we validate the email on registration? Or can we send them an email, a welcome email when they uh, do their first order? Or after they do the first order, or if they click this icon, do they, uh, can we track uh, all their, all the actions that they do? Um, and a couple of iterations later, uh, they come back to us and say, Oh, can we integrate with with our CRM and our warehouse and the and the, oh man, and that becomes like this huge. Slowly, slowly, it just becomes this huge, big ball of mud. Yeah, everything is talking to everything. We're hacking from you know we we're, we're talking to the database directly from the UI. We have some shortcuts. New engineers come in, into the team. And they don't know the beautiful design, or they don't have the context of what what was what was the idea about the, the the very elegant and clean design that we put together, and they start shortcutting um, because of the fear that if they make a small change over there, the whole system will start behaving differently, or all their tests, the acceptance tests, will fail, and um, we are in this. Um, very, um, we, we end up with this very, very complicated, very hard to maintain code base. And every time, um, you know, it escalates in the first year, a change request takes a, a week, maybe a, a couple of days, you know, to put into production. By the third year, it, it takes, um, it could take up to six months to, to pu push a change request through because we do a small change. That small, that small change has side effects. Those side effects um, create bugs. Those bugs need to be fixed. When we fix the bugs, we introduce new bugs, <laughs> and so on and so forth. And we get to a point where you know, kind of development and maintenance uh, become a real uh, pain. We 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 and a real risk. And um, the business is reluctant to to introduce new changes and to um, uh, to follow what really needs to be done in the system in order to be more successful, and we are in a we we go you know we 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 kind of shy, sheepishly go to the to our uh, CTO or our development manager or the business and say listen this this we can't do this anymore this is not maintainable we are in a position where the risk of making any changes to the system is unacceptable. The cost of um, of refactoring or the cost of putting a new new change into the system just is not not cost effective. Yeah. So 
most of us, or at least I did this a couple of times and said, you know, oh, let's let's just, you know, now we know the domain, now we know the business, we understand what's going on, let's just be right, right? And it does sound amazing, right? Because now we know everything and of course we have all these new frameworks and new technology and new patterns and we're, we're going to make it so much better this time, right? And um, and it sounds very convincing. The reality is that you go and start redesigning the system using the same methodology. You're just going to end up in the same place. You're just going to be three years later, you're going to be in the same place and you're going to rewrite again, right? So let's try and think how we can maybe approach it a little bit different and uh, avoid the big ball of mud uh, outcome that's almost inevitable in this uh, in this scenario. And what I'm proposing is that we try and decompose our system. Uh, we try and uh, take the bits that uh, that belong together and think of them differently. And um, and maybe instead of focusing on the data model focus on the user interaction, what activities are, are happening in our system and what what are they, how do they um, perform and what kind of business capabilities do they um, uh, enable us to, to do. Um, and, and of course, if you're going to do this uh, on an existing domain, it's going to be on an existing system, that's going to be extremely hard, but, but, it's, but it's a lot better than doing a rewrite. Now, just to, to a caveat here, obviously, if you're doing a rewrite on a, on a, you know, if it's a startup, if it's a, you know, you're just trying something, if you built this in three months and now you're ready to, to go the next mile and you're, uh, yeah, absolutely rewrite. If there's a little bit of data, if you have 10 customers on platform, absolutely, probably rewrite would be cost effective. Although it's highly risky, there's still a, a chance to kind of get out of it. But if you're talking about the system that lives for, I don't know, 15 years or two, five years, and you have tera, multiple terabytes or petabytes of data and um, customers that are many customers or many users that rely on the system, rewrite is usually not an option. You're going to end up with chasing your tail. You know, the, there's, there's going to be system A and system B. They're going to you know, the new version and the old version, they're going to um, uh, leave one beside the other. And every time you do a change in one system, you're going to do, you know, <laughs> come back to clean up the old system. Um, and and then after you've done all the, you know, you migrated everything and you you're ready to go live with the new system, uh, there's going to the small issue of data migration. Um, and from my, my, one of my experiences was that we needed uh, three months physical time to transfer, yeah, to take the data from one system and transfer it over to the new system, right? So obviously that wasn't, <laughs> that wasn't a runner. And that system actually never went to V2. It, it stayed on, uh, or to V3, it stayed on V2. Um, so let's, let's try and take, a different approach. Um, I'm, I, I'm sure most of you heard of DDD and most of you heard of uh, Eric Evans' book. Um, Eric wrote the, the book in 2003, so that's quite a long, long time ago. And he kind of tried to build a, a new paradigm around um, how we how we how we look at, at our uh, domain at our domains, how how we look at our systems. Um, and um, uh, if you read um, uh, this book, um, which many people read the beginning and go and implement, I'd suggest you read the other part of the book, which is the strategic design section, which is uh, very interesting. Um, but the 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 point about uh, the point I want to take from DDD here is the. Um, Eric's focus on the activity. So every software program relates to some activity or interest of its user. And it, it's, it's really interesting because 
us as engineers, we usually build systems, yeah? We, we just, we, we want to build technology. We want to build this thing that works and has all these shiny new things and it's, uh, it uses all the latest frameworks and the latest uh, uh, shortcuts and we want a cookie cut, you know, we want to use a cookie cutter to just go, yeah, if we, if we do this here, we do this over there. And, and, I, and don't get me wrong, Totally, you know, when you have patterns, you should use patterns, and you should build stuff in a in a very um, uh, repeatable way, so you can, or at least the process should be repeatable, so you can learn from it and and get better. But the point is that we are building a system at the end of the day for the business to be viable, for the business to make money, and so that they can pay us to have fun, right? <laughs> so um, and what makes that system viable is the activity that the user is trying to to do on that on that uh, system of course it could be the um the uh, another system talking to another system it could be a business process that runs and it and there's no interactive user per se but the uh, given that activity you could um, carve out a the, the the business value of what you're building rather than just building a model with a lot of stuff in it and uh, then putting you know latch, latch, latching on the code and making it work kind of thing um, and that would be a, a totally different um, kind of a, a different view on on how we de design our software this is also in the context of the today's world, yeah? So maybe 20, 30 years ago, the business cycle and the speed and the, the changes that were uh, introduced into software and, or, or what software solved in the world were a lot slower. It was all right to build a monolith and it was all right to take six months to build a new feature and a year to deploy another uh, a big feature or to slowly evolve the software to be more like what the users want. Today, it's unacceptable. Today, you can pivot, you know, you do one thing and then you say, oh, let's do an A-B test with this other thing. Yeah, maybe we'll try and um, uh, change the color or change the sequence of activities or what data we collect from the user. Maybe we shouldn't collect any data from the user. Maybe we, we should just send him an email and have him click a link and he'll do the other things or whatever. So. All these, the today's software world is a lot faster. It changes rapidly. In order to be competitive, in order to be relevant, you need to change all the time. Let's talk a little bit about just the basic concept. So context is uh, what we we uh, what gives us the the environment or what is is uh, is make makes something um, uh, meaningful. Yeah. So. Uh, it's the setting of the work um, in, in which the work statement appears that determines its meaning. So it's the meaningful, it's, it's what makes something meaningful. Um, of course, different contexts might change what things mean. And, you know, if you talk about different languages, different cultures, uh, people think, I don't know, I'm from Ireland and in Ireland uh, we say, hey, what's the crack, right? And oh, how's the crack, right? And crack is like fun. It's like the 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 cheers, right? In America, <laughs> this is a you know crack cocaine or something. Yeah. So obviously, uh, that's a, um, an example of uh, context. And boundary, boundary is the other thing that that is interesting because the boundary uh, boundary determines how well you can execute on anything because. Uh, for example, scope, right? If you're uh, given a, a certain scope, you know that you don't need to do the other things. Yeah, You know that you need to do this specific task and the other things are out of scope. That's a boundary. A boundary is like when I let you do some things um, in our relationship, but I won't let you do other things because that I don't think that's respectful or I don't allow you because that will override my, my authority in something. Um, and in the business context or in the software context, that defines what I own or what my component owns or what my component is allowed to do and what I don't, what doesn't I don't own, but I could 
have knowledge of. So I, I might have some context, right? But my bound my boundary is does not allow me to change that context. Yeah, that sorry that data or that. So if I'm a component that is responsible for managing the authentication, I don't do authorization and I don't do account management and I don't do billing and I don't do shipping. Um, and if you put the two things together, we come up with this the concept of uh, of DDD, which is called bounded context. It is the, in simple ways, in simple terms, I think you can say that it it is what we are, uh, it is the, the condition of which we can um, make something applicable, make something do something. So if we are um, uh, in the bounded context of, uh, uh, creating a new user. I'm sorry, but I'm you know that's uh, that's my thing, the user thing. But uh, creating a new quote, creating a new claim in insurance for car insurance, or um, asking for a, I don't know verification of something. That is the bounded context. We are in this context of trying to do this activity. We have a certain boundary that we do only the things that we say that we're going to do. And that fulfills a business process, that fulfills a business capability that is well-defined. And if you take that uh, business process or user interaction and um, try and, and model it around th that bounded context, you are now very explicit and very clear about what this this thing, whether it's a component or a collection of components or maybe a service uh, in the context of service and architecture, this is the boundary. This is the thing that, that can do and execute this one thing. Um, just relating to data in that context, if I own a piece of um, of functionality in the in the system, then I also own the data that corresponds with that that um, um, that bounded context or that interactive that activity, and I am the only one in the system that's allowed to change it. So I'm I can you know other other components and other parts of the system and other uh, bounded context maybe can read my information can know of my activities and I will probably publish events or tell them about what's happening in, inside my bounded context, but I'm the only one in the system that's allowed to make those changes. Yeah, there's no two, two uh, there couldn't be like one system that can change the, the user here and can also change the user over there. And it's the same user. It could be different context, right? It could be like my billing information is different to my login information or my shipping information, yeah? And they're still touching the same user logically, but all they share is an ID, okay? So that, that's kind of the bounded context concept. So let's, uh, let's move into the more practical uh, side of things, I hope. Um, I don't know who knows Dune or who loves it. I love Dune. I've, I've, I've read the books since I was, I don't know, a child, I think, or a teenager. And then, uh, and yay, we have a new movie coming up. Uh, I'm really excited. So yeah, how do we fight this, this, uh, this monolith? How do we, um, uh, how, do, how, how do we go about it uh, without killing ourselves and, um, and winning the war. Um, so the starting point that um, I think, again, it, this is like an optimistic uh, and a very um, a clean piece of data or piece of a, a data model that we can all kind of relate to, right? Big tables, loads of fields in the table. This is a relatively clean model, but still, one of the things that's really clear here is that everything has a relationship. We have foreign keys and we have um, referential integrity in place, which means that those, effectively those tables, although they're decomposed into small, smaller tables, 
they're effectively a monolith. Yeah, they, you can't do something to one table without having data in the other tables or vice versa. And then when we you delete a record in one table, you have to delete all the rest, right? Um, and that is a a very common starting point, definitely in, in the monolith world. Um, and and let's see what let's let's take another view on that on that model. As as I said before, I'm going to focus on the user, but you can take that to a, you know a car insurance claim, a car insurance policy, a life insurance, a pension, blah blah, blah whatever, uh, whatever your domain is, a bank account, your bank, your uh, and the traditional design would would have sustained that we have a user entity and that user entity has many fields and although in the in this model we broke it apart to multiple tables effectively you can't create one field in one table without doing other things or uh, coming back to other um, sorry fulfilling the referential integrity between different fields of the same entity in different tables um, so what I'm trying to do is just suggest maybe a different approach to this. Um, so if we take the bounded context of user authentication, the only thing we do in user authentication is to grab a user's uh, first name and last name, sorry, <laughs> user's email or, or the user ID or user, um, uh, user name, I guess, and its password. And we try and authenticate it against our system, right? So to fulfill that, all we need in, in this scenario, at least, is our email and our password. We also might have a, a, another function or another part of the of the registration process uh, that um, that verifies the email. It's very common today. Yeah, this is something and we probably would log in the last, you know, that would be part of our uh, authentication. We want to know what, when was he, he was last logged in. Maybe it's here, maybe it's not, but let's say that this is the story. And blocked date, of course. So if this user has been blocked for some reason or his, uh, his account was uh, um, disabled or something like that, then we want to keep track of that. So uh, every time the user authenticates, we know those things. Obviously, when we create an authentication, we again, can can see the correlation of these are the things we need. We don't need the first name, we don't need the last name, we don't need the contact email. In that scenario, we don't need phone numbers, we don't need this address, we don't need payment option or anything like that, right? Let's look at, the, at another bounded context, customer contact. Customer contact is a different context again. It is where, you know, maybe the support or uh, sales or marketing want to contact the, the customer. This is our CRM kind of context, yeah? And for that, we'll need the first name, uh, we'll need his last name, we'll need a contact email that might be different to his login email, but maybe not. Uh, but in the context of the customer contact, that would, even though it's the same email as the authentication, if it is, it is a different email in the context, okay? We have the contact phone number and we have the home address because we want to post him stuff, right? And we could, we might. And another bounded context is customer billing. So in billing, where we care about his, his, uh, you know, how how we can take money off him. Yeah. So uh, the customer payment options maybe has a bank account linked to our system and maybe has some credit cards. Or maybe he wants to pay by invoice or whatever. Yeah. So these are the payment options, and also he might have his payment card. So his payment card would be on file. Again, this is a bounded context. Might be a couple of interactions that are all in this one bounded context. But in order to create a, a billing, you would have the you would need one or more of those uh, fields. And in order to read the billing or to get the billing details or to change billing details, you'll need those fields, yeah? And again, we go to another bounded context, which is customer account. And customer account is is more like, you know, this is like a kind of a bank account or account settings or maybe preferences and stuff like that. But in the user context, it will be like whether the account is active or not, 
maybe the date of birth, maybe it's relevant to customer account, maybe it should be in customer contact, or maybe it should be in customer marketing, whatever. Yeah? And the same for um, a mobile verified, maybe it should be part of authentication, maybe it should be something else, but maybe account is a good place for it. Again, it depends on the context of what you're building, and it might met, it might fit better in one bundled context or another. But it's only going to be in one bundled context. It's not going to be there. Are not going to be any duplicates here. Just to be clear, okay. Um, and is preferred again. <clears throat> we made a, a customer bought loads of loads of stuff with us, so we are going to make him a preferred customer, and we want to know about it. We might have it in the customer account. We might have it in and uh, the pricing component or the sales component or whatever, you know, it's like it might move all over, right? But again, we're trying to kind of narrow in on the user context, right? And then shipping, again, shipping might uh, might be in, in available, you know, might do the things, all the things that have to do with shipping, right? Um, so shipping address in the context of the user, um, but it also might have, uh, you know, multiple shipping addresses, uh, uh, preferred shipping method, you know, shipping that, you know, and so on and so forth. That goes on to be a lot of things. The point is that once we break down all those, we we now broken down this user entity um, to all these components, yeah. And now we don't have a user in the system anymore, yeah. There is no concept. There's no entity. Uh, there's no table. Those 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 colored fields each are going to be in their own table or tables that belong to each bounded context. Um, and, and now we are, we, we are creating a much more loosely coupled uh, data model or model that is directly or vertically uh, uh, coupled, I guess, to the to the uh, user interaction or the business function that we're uh, trying to um, create, yeah, um, and it's all about coupling, yeah, uh, because coupling introduces the when when we introduce coupling, we we make change very very hard, and we make things that that depend. Uh, we we create a lot of dependencies now. There is not going to be a system that has no coupling whatsoever. It's never going to happen. It's a, it's a, it's a useless system, right? If the system has doesn't, if a component uh, has no coupling, uh, then it probably doesn't do anything with anything. Huh? So, uh, um, so we are here looking at coupling on, um, uh, on what how we can make coupling more uh, beneficial to us or serve our purpose. And in that context, in the bounded context, each of those components, they are highly coupled. Yeah, Inside those, those, those components, there's high coupling and high cohesion. We are doing, it's all the business things that we're trying to do for those different bounded contexts. Yeah, But in between those, we have loose coupling and we have um, we have uh, we, we have the ability to uh, to change those components separately and to make things a lot more um, cohesive and more, a lot easier to change and um, uh, and and at, at the end of the day that could could give us a much better uh, system to work with. Um, so you know. Just uh, try and, uh, and you know try and think like that, and try and look at your system this way. And if you're attempting to to chip away at your system, uh, start on the edges. Try to find the things that are uh, lend themselves well to kind of uh, move, being moved out and being carved out of the database, and move and, and reduce your referential integrity. And remember that. The bounded context is what gives you the power to fulfill the business functionality that the user wants to do. Um, 
you can use the strangler pattern. You can use APIs to create uh, seams to to uh, hide away your changes in the background. There are a lot of patterns around that, how to chip away at your system. Um, but the important thing is to figure out those bounded contexts and then find what belongs together. These are what SOA called, you know, in SOA we say it's the services, the overloaded term services, but that that is where you want to end up. If you want to end up with with like a collection of components or collection of bounded contexts that actually belong together and they're very, um, they like to talk to each other more than others, yeah? Um, one more thing before I let you go is that remember that all all this comes into the to your uh, there's a lot of composition going on in your UI. It it might be in the, your APIs in APIs with other systems and um, data composition where you talk about read models or reporting and caching and so on. So you know it's not like a black and white. Uh, you know, I, I'll slice and dice everything to small components, and everything will work. It's it's a it's more holistic view of of the system. So, you know, in Amazon's uh, example, you know, you have the little account component at the top, and the shopping cart, and the orders, and the recommended stuff, and the item itself, and the options on the item, and the logo, and all that. So, you know, you probably know it yourself. I'm not saying anything new. Um, so, yeah. Um, now we could, I'd like to go to Q and A if that's okay with you. If we have any questions, I'll take them now, and then we'll do a, a summary. <laughs> okay, so we are back for the questions, and we have a few questions indeed. Uh, we have about uh, five minutes to answer them, so let's do that <laughs> pretty quickly. <laughs> Anyway, uh, okay. the newest question is from Vidas. He's asking, how do you suggest enforcing limits of what data a context can access? It's all about the design, I guess. The the um, enforcement is, uh, there, there are many levels of enforcement. So I'd say, you know, like you either uh, agree on the team, the way you enforce stuff, you can build your repositories or your access data access components or your data access patterns to um, to work by convention, so you can't access something else, uh, or you cannot write to something else. That's more important. Um, naturally, um, when when you start building those things and you start to deploy them to production or even to your test system, you will find that. If things be, depend on each other, you will have to end up with like a super duper uh, one uh, big atomic uh, deployment, and that is a bad sign, right? So those things would usually, you know, work themselves out because you don't want to end up there. You want to be able to deploy each component separately, and you want to keep coupling very light in that aspect. I hope that answers it. Okay, I hope Vidas is satisfied. And uh, one bigger question left, but uh, we need a short answer for that. So let's try doing okay. that. Uh, <laughs> so the question is, is DDD relevant without microservices? As it seems that it does not connect to the real business problem when it is taken, when it is taken alone, not part of a bigger solution like microservices. Well, they're interlinked. I think that uh, DDD is is DDD is interpreted in many many ways in our in our in our industry, and um, and definitely I, I could definitely say that if you're doing microservices, you should embrace a lot of principles from DDD to avoid uh, ending up with the distributed monolith. I hope that makes sense. Okay, that was a Perfect. quick and short answer. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Uh, so, okay. If you guys will have any more questions, you can definitely uh, always chat with the uh, with Sean uh, just as after the session. Just go in the virtual rooms and just down below the Queen Room where we are right now, we have chat with the speaker button. So you can always chat with Sean there. And um, uh, for now, I will let you continue. I know you have something else to say, and uh, we're gonna end it on time in six minutes. Cool. I might have even uh, finished before time. Um, so what I want you to leave to leave you guys with um, is that uh, you know remember the user activity and the bounded context concepts. Remember to uh, keep your boundaries. 
reduce coupling between the bounded contacts. If you, sorry, <clears throat> if you can, please do use asynchronous communication using uh, queues and um, uh, message queues and uh, asynchronous uh, communication, pub sub, publish subscribe, and um, remember that if you can break an entity into fields that correlate to a bounded context, you're winning. And although it's hard, it's really, really hard to do because it's a mind-bending mind -bending exercise. It's, it's something that uh, will make your life so much easier uh, as you build and scale your system. Um, and it won't be perfect. Don't worry about it. Iterate. Keep on experimenting and make your uh, and grow your system as you go along. You learn more, you experiment more, and be be happy to fail because those failures will teach you very good lessons. Thank you. Okay, uh, just a second. I'm checking if I'm back. I should be back. That's amazing. <laughs> okay, so uh, thank you very much for your speech. I think the audience is very happy too. And we still have a few minutes, so I have a secret question for you that I was <laughs> hoping I will have time to ask. Oh, so do tell me, please, what is the story behind your world record for the most uh, uh, for answering the most questions about the end service bus? So I started working with N-Service Bus in version one point something, which was still a, an open source project uh, with UD. Uh, I wasn't working with UD, I was working on my own projects, but I started working, it was 2009, I think, or 2008. And um, it just so happens, you know, that um, I've, I've managed to answer a lot of questions. Um, I've been working with uh, particular for the last six years. It's actually my seventh year now. Um, so yeah, and and I've been sitting on you know live chat today's live chat on customer support and uh, I've been work talking to customers and that's what I like doing. That's I, I want to have impact on developers, making developers better, and that's what that's 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 how I try and do this. <laughs> Just like that, just, just easily like that, just a world <laughs> record, you know. And uh, uh, <clears throat> that's a joke. That, that's a yeah, I know. But we had a we had a we had a question from Carlos in the very beginning of the speech, though. Mm -hmm. uh, very short and very concrete question: and service bus or mass transit? <laughs> So uh, that's commercial, and I'm happy to answer the question. Um, Enterprise Bus uh, has a, a couple of very important benefits over mass transit. The fact that you have support, the fact that you have uh, the platform that surrounds it, and the fact that you have a solid, um, you know, lifetime, if you wish, you know, th this company is not going away. It's been around for, I don't know what, eight years now, nine years as a commercial company. Uh, it's a commercial product. You get support. You get uh, uh, the things that you know in mass transit. With all due respect, you know they're they're doing a great uh, job, but we we don't uh, we're not going to fail you. We are customer centric, and we will um, make sure that if uh, you have an outage in production, it's uh, going to be so sorted. And uh, <laughs> you, you, you're not going to run in the middle of the night to figure out. Um, and I think the other the other important things are the platform, obviously. The uh, if you know Service Pulse, Service Control, uh, Service Insight, those are debugging and monitoring tools that uh, enable you to do um, to to make your life um, working with messaging so much nicer and so much easier. Doing retries, knowing that things went down. Analyzing your Sega state, your um, what, what's going on, what's broken, whatever. So performance now we have this new performance thing, which is great. Yeah. So, and we're progressing all the time. Isn't it easy <laughs> to talk about your stuff? <laughs> yes. Just give me the opportunity. <laughs> Just give you the opportunity. Put your ad right here. <laughs> Okay, Sean, thank you very much. Uh, once again, I want to remind the audience that you can still chat with Sean uh, just click by clicking the button below in the virtual rooms, below the Queen stage, chat with the speaker. And if you have any more questions or you want to listen to some more 
of his wisdom and knowledge. Please tune in right now. And we are about to end. So yeah, wave bye-bye. And I'll see you really quickly in a few minutes with the next speaker. Thank you.